Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so excited to see you all and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder to change our world. These Explorer Classroom events connect students from all around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. We host school days events on Mondays at 11 a.m. Eastern and Thursdays at 10 and 2 Eastern. And we team up with our friends at the Mott Foundation for these special after-school events. I wanna start this afternoon by wishing everyone a very happy Geography Awareness Week. And today I'm excited to introduce you all to Alex Tate. Alex holds the position of the geographer at the National Geographic Society. And a geographer's job is all about maps. So Alex heads the Map Policy Committee for National Geographic and develops mapping resources with the National Geographic Labs. And sometimes he even gets to head out into the field for some cutting edge research and on-site mapping excitement. Alex spent some time oh, just a little bit ago on an expedition to Mount Everest. I bet some of you guys have heard about that. He's gonna to talk to us all about that amazing experience mapping the world's highest mountain. But before we get to that, I want to acknowledge that we're joined by a bunch of cool students up on screen with us and we have hundreds and hundreds more of you watching along on YouTube. We are so excited to have you all here today. We've got students representing Australia, Arizona, Brazil, California, Canada, Colorado, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Delaware, Florida, Hawaii, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, India, Indonesia, Italy, Kentucky, Libya, Massachusetts, Malaysia, Maryland, Maine, Mexico, Mississippi, New Zealand, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Russia, South Africa, Texas, Virginia, Venezuela, Washington, Wisconsin, and West Virginia. So wonderful to have so many of you out there. If I missed where you're watching from, go ahead and let us know in the chat bar. We would love to say hi in a little bit. But for now, we're gonna start with a short lesson from Alex. After that, we'll take questions from all of you in the audience. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over. Alex, go ahead and take it away. I can't wait to hear about Mount Everest. Great, thank you, Celeste, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today. And this is Geography Awareness Week, and geography is all about understanding where things are, knowing where they are and why they are where they are. And one of the most important tools for understanding the world and understanding where things are is the map. And I'm gonna talk about maps, but in particular, I'm gonna be talking about making maps of Mount Everest, collecting data, collecting information about Mount Everest and putting it into a map. So I'm gonna share my screen so I can show you some of the things that I got to do and show you some things about maps and how you make maps. All right, let's make sure sound is on because I have a few videos to share with you. Are we looking okay, Celeste? It's looking pretty good, Alex. All right, so first of all, I wanna show you where I got to go, which was an amazing place almost at the other side of the world from where I live in Maryland in the United States. This is Mount Everest, the tallest mountain of the world. And you can see it's a land of snow and ice and rocks. It's the highest mountain range in the world and the highest mountain in the world. So. This is a mountain, this is a photograph of a mountain. We wanna talk about mapping this mountain. As you know, maps are essentially pictures of the world looking from above. And this is a picture of the part of the world where Mount Everest is uh, in Asia, uh, in a country called Nepal, actually, actually on the border of Nepal and China and they share the mountain. And we can zoom in a little bit farther and you can see that there's white lines showing rivers there's some snow-capped mountains and there's black dashed lines showing the different countries. And Mount Everest is in the middle of the Himalaya mountain range. So how do we go from a picture like this of a mountain to a map of the mountain? Well, that's what I was gonna be doing in Nepal and did in Nepal uh, two, a year and a half ago. But I wanted to show you a picture of the very first cartographer or map maker 
that National Geographic ever hired. And this is way back 100 years ago in 1914. And this is Albert Bumstead, and he was mapping in the Andes, which is another mountain range, very big one in South America. And you can see he's looking over a map table and he's using pen and ink to draw the map of the different river valleys and mountains in the Andes. So he was actually using pen and ink on paper. We don't do that today. I love to be able to show you what we're doing as map makers in 2019. We're using very complicated computers and electronic devices to capture information, but it's really the same thing. We're mapping the world through different tools, whether it's pen and ink on paper or a digital camera like this. So National Geographic has worked at ma on mapping Mount Everest before. This is one of my predecessors, his a cartographer or map maker named Brad Washburn. And he made a beautiful map looking at Mount Everest from above. And again, you can see this is a map showing snow and rock that's very similar to the snow and rock you saw in the photograph, but looked at from above. So a year and a half ago, that's me. I got to go to Nepal and work on a mapping expedition. I was part of a big group doing all sorts of science in Nepal. People were studying biology. They were studying the plants and animals in the high mountains. Some of my colleagues were looking for the highest plants and the highest animals that live anywhere in the world. Some of my other colleagues and friends were looking at the snow and ice and how fast it's melting in the high mountains. So this is our big group. We had all sorts of scientists, and we also had climbers that helped us work in the high mountains. And this is base camp at Mount Everest. This is where we lived for six weeks. So I lived in a tent for six weeks while I was doing my work. And a lot of times it wasn't that cold. So some days we got to sit out in the sunshine and it was maybe 35 degrees, maybe five degrees Celsius. Other times it was really cold, well below freezing. And it wasn't always fun and games. We had to look out for things like this. This is an avalanche coming off the mountain. Is it gonna make it all the way? That we saw coming across the glacier towards our camp. It was very exciting and it's very dangerous. You don't wanna be under an avalanche like that. One of the other things we had to contend with was getting sick at base camp. So I actually, this is me, I had to spend five days going all the way down to a village to get better after getting sick. So there were other things that you had to worry about, not just your work. But we did a lot of mapping work. And this is my friend, Chris. He's mapping using a mini helicopter called a drone. So he's controlling it from handheld controls. And many of you may have seen one of these or maybe even used one. This one has a very advanced camera so that we can map using the drone. And this is a video showing what the picture of base camp looks like from the drone. So this is the drone flying over base camp. And you can see all the different tents. Most of those are for climbers that are gonna climb Mount Everest. You can see some of the tents are very big like that white one there and they have very comfortable accommodations. So that's me doing some work with my digital camera. And you can see I got some help. There are some dogs that live at base camp. And you can see right below me is one of the dogs that was helping me that day. He was keeping me company. So I wanna give you a few pictures of what we get from the mapping work we do. You can see all these little dots are recording the tents and the glacier where we were at base camp. So we also worked with helicopters and mapping from helicopters. So I wanna give you the feeling of what it was like for my friends who were on the helicopter mapping the glacier that Mount Everest. That's flying, that helicopter is flying at about 24,000 feet way up high on Mount Everest. And it's taking pictures like this. So you can see that this picture from above is sort of halfway between a photograph and a map. And we converted this into maps of all the different tents and where the glaciers were and the ice. And you can see the difference between rocks and ice here in this photograph. 
And we built all these different photographs, over 32,000 photographs into a big map of the entire glacier. And some of the data we collected looks like this when you put it into a picture. So this is a three-dimensional model of the glacier. And that was also collected from the helicopter. So there's my friend, Chris. He's showing how our, how our drone mapping works to some of the kids that were in the village nearby to Mount Everest. So I thought I'd be able to show you one of the drones that we use, which I have right here. And so this is a drone for mapping and we can put a battery in it and we can extend the legs and arms for a drone. And this is one of the drones we actually used on Mount Everest to do some of the photo mapping last year. So that's all about mapping at Mount Everest, lots of technology and tools, but it's all about creating maps that we can then use to understand what it looks like in areas like that. So thank you for your attention. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and we can talk. Oh, Alex, that was absolutely amazing. I can't believe it was 32,000 photos that went into that map, so cool. Thank you for all of that work. Thank you for sharing it with us today. And for everyone out there, if you've got questions, it's the best time of the day, it's question time. Send them to us, please. Um, you can use that YouTube chat bar. I know you've all already found it. I can see everything you're doing in there. Send us your questions and, and let us know who's asking so we can give your students a shout out. Please don't spam us though. Again, we're recording everything you sent. Just send your questions once, please. Um, but our first question will come to us from an on-screen group. We've got the Myers family up here with us. You guys wanna ask our first question? Go for it. How do you stay mentally and physically fit to withstand the harsh conditions and low oxygen in the high altitude climate? That's a great question because you're not gonna be able to do your work if you're not fit and you're not healthy. So there's a couple of things that go into that. You definitely want really good equipment so you have warm clothes. And for my uh, friends that were going very high up on the mountain, they actually carried extra oxygen. I didn't need to carry oxygen that you would breathe through a mask when I was at base camp doing my mapping work. But it took me 10 days to go from where we flew in to up to Everest base camp because you don't wanna to go too high too fast. So a lot of it's about preparation and knowing how to work in the mountains. And part of that is having a very good support team that knows all about this. So we had a Sherpa team that was helping us with our work. And these were local Nepalese climbers and uh, uh, workers that could help us. And they knew exactly how long it took to get to very high elevation to work. Awesome. Well, Alex, Plus you that... need really good food and a really good cook. Oh, I've heard about the food that you guys ate. I, I'll let you talk about that in a second. But first, we've got a burning question in the chat bar. So many people are wondering, including Christopher and Gabriella and username eggs are cool. They all want to know how long you were there for and how long it took you to make the maps afterwards. Good question. So I was at Everest Base Camp for six weeks, but it was a full two months. So two weeks beforehand and a week after. So I was in Nepal for a bit more than two months in 2019 to do the work in the field. Then we bring all those photographs that are on hard drives or on computers, we bring them all back to the lab in Maryland, in the United States to process all those photographs and make maps from them. And that process, believe it or not, we're still working on some aspects of that now, a year later. So the initial work takes about two, two and a half months, but the hard work of using the data, processing it and getting information from it, that can take a year or a year and a half. Wow. All right, well, let's go to Samson and Jude for our next question. Go for it, folks. They asked Okay, go ahead. Go, Samson. So, Alex, did you bring special tools like hiking pit, like hiking sticks? 
We did. We brought a lot of special tools for walking around on the glacier and for climbing the glacier up high on the mountain. So we had special walking sticks for just do, walking on the, the rocks and, and the snow, but we also had ice axes. And ice axes are for walking on very steep glaciers. In case you slip, the ice axe is something that can hold you onto the mountain. We also had a very uh, important team of Sherpa climbers and guides that set up ropes on the very dangerous parts so that you were attached to a rope in case you slipped and fell and the rope would catch you. So we had a lot of special equipment for climbing and moving around the mountain that wasn't the mapping equipment. And you saw some of the mapping equipment was very elaborate, but we also had to have the climbing and hiking equipment to be safe in the mountain. Well, speaking of your equipment, we've got Zayden in the chat bar who's wondering if any of your equipment suffered in that extreme environment. Did you lose any drones? Did any of your gear get messed up? So we lost two drones. One of our drone pilots was, he was actually one of our, on our media team. So he was using one of his drones, not my drone, thankfully. He was using his drone to do photographs and videos of the team at work. And he lost control of his drone. So every now and then, sometimes the, the communication goes on the fritz and his drone crashed into the side of the mountain. And he went and got it and it was all broken into pieces. So he lost one drone and he got a replacement. And then the replacement drone flew into a crevasse. So he lost two drones. So yes, you have, to, you have to be aware that sometimes the equipment doesn't always work just the way you want to. What a way to go though, if you had to pick, right? If you're gonna lose a drone into a crevasse on Mount Everest, it's a pretty, pretty epic way to lose it. Well, uh, Alex, we've got another really popular question. We've got a lot of people asking if avalanches were common and if anybody got hurt while you were on Everest. So they are common and nobody got hurt, which is very good for our year. There have been avalanches that have uh, killed people. So it is something you need to be very aware of. But I would say that on average, we would see one every two or three days, like the one I showed in that video. And mostly they were across, we, we, Everest Base Camp is in an area that's relatively safe from avalanches. That's why it's located where it is. And you have to make sure that when the sun warms up the ice, you're not walking under a cliff that has ice up above that may fall off. So you have to be very knowledgeable about the mountain. And this is where our Sherpa guides come in. They know how the mountain is gonna behave at different times of the day. And a lot of the climbing happens in the dark. You actually climb a lot of the mountain in the dark when the ice is frozen and isn't going to be avalanching. So cool. Well, let's go to Alex L for a question. Go for it. So, um, how do they map? So, yeah, how do you map um, when there's snow and like and leaves? Yeah, how do you map and um, that, those times. That's a really good question. Sometimes there's things that are in the way of getting a good map from photographs. So there can be snow, there can be trees with lots of leaves on them, there can be clouds. Well, there's, there are tools that allow us to see through clouds. So you've probably heard of something called radar. And radar is radiation that will go through the clouds, bounce off the earth and go back to the sensor on the helicopter. So you can see through the clouds or you can see through the leaves of the trees because you have a beam of light that bounces down to the ground and some of it gets reflected by the leaves and some of it gets reflected by the ground. So really good equipment will allow you to see through some of those things. We've got a related question in the chat bar. We've got Aiden wondering what the very most difficult part of mapping is. Other than things getting in your way, what are some other challenges, uh, oh. Alex? One of the most difficult parts of mapping and one of the most challenging parts is knowing how accurate your map is. When you take a photograph, it actually gets distorted by the angles of the light that are reaching the camera. It's pretty complex, but things can be recorded not quite in the right place. 
And so one of the most challenging parts of mapping is to make corrections and adjustments so that we know exactly where in the world that photograph is located. And we use a grid system of lines called latitude and longitude to be able to record exactly where things are. And getting that as accurate as possible is a big challenge. Very cool. All right, well, we've got Mr. Seymour's Afternoon Explorers who are wondering if cell phones work on Mount Everest. And did you use yours? Did you take any pictures while you were up there? I took a lot of pictures. It was really a, a adventure and an expedition of a lifetime for me. I've always wanted to go to the Himalaya mountains and I got to go on this expedition. So yes, I took lots of photographs. There was not cell coverage at base camp. So your cell phone didn't work as a phone at base camp, but some very entrepreneurial Nepali workers set up internet at base camp. So they had a satellite hookup. So satellite phones and satellite hookups to the internet did work. And so we paid to get internet access. So I could do email and do Skype and uh, WhatsApp phone calls. But the cell phones didn't work, but you could get calls out, which is really amazing because you're way out up on this mountain and you can have connection. But that's recent. That's probably in the last five years, 10 years, maybe. Before that, nobody could, you couldn't communicate. Awesome. Well, we've got Kathy wondering how high up you were and how high up you started. Where, where did you start ah, your climbing and your question. mapping and all your work? So when we went as a team, we flew from the United States to the capital of Nepal called Kathmandu, which is at about almost 5,000 5, feet, about 12, 1,300 meters. So it's similar to the height of Denver, Colorado, for example. From Kathmandu, we then flew to a little town in the mountains below Everest called Lukla, which is at about 10 or 11,000 feet about 3,500 meters. And that's more like Breckenridge ski area in Colorado. That's like up near the top of a mountain in Colorado. And from there, we then hiked another seven or 8,000 feet up to Everest Base Camp at 5,300 meters, which is about 18, 19,000 feet. So higher than any mountain in the United States other than Denali in Alaska. So Everest Base Camp is just a little bit lower than the summit of the highest mountain in North America. And then my friends who went way high on the mountain, they got all the way up to 8,400 meters. They got 400 meters below the top of Mount Everest to set up a weather station. So they were the ones that got highest on the mountain on our team. Very cool. Well, let's take a question from the Soriano family. Go for it. Did you spend 49 days at Mount Everest? <laughs> I spent six weeks. So how many, how many days is six weeks? So I was six weeks at base camp. So that's about 42 days, but it took me a week to hike up to base camp. So you're about right. 49, 50 days, I was up in the mountains doing my work. That is awesome. We've got an LMS class who are wondering what different technologies are affected by weather in an extreme place like Mount Everest, specifically like LIDAR, radar, your drones. How, how does weather impact your mapping? So it impacted it in a couple of ways, as you might imagine. So if the weather was really, well, for example, if we had really high winds, we couldn't fly our drones. The drones won't stay stable in really high winds and we risked having them crash and we didn't want to lose the drone. So high winds are a problem. Dense clouds, you can't see. The drone work we were doing is with photographs and you can't photograph through, through the clouds. So those are definitely issues. The other thing that happened halfway through our work is we got a snowstorm. And so all the whole area of base camp was covered in snow. And we wanted a map that would show the areas without the snow on them. We wanted to see the rocks and the rubble on the glacier. So we had to wait for the snow to melt before we started mapping again. Awesome. Well, let's take a question from the Willett family. Go for it, folks. 
Can drones fly higher than helicopters to take to make maps? That's a good question. So the drones can fly just as high as the helicopters on Mount Everest, which is amazing. The air gets very thin and the helicopters and the drones, their blades need to actually catch some air. Even though you think air doesn't have any weight to it, it's got some substance to it and the, the propellers have to catch the, the rotors have to catch the air. And so the drones can and the helicopters can get just about the same height, 24, 25,000 feet um, and even higher um, in special cases. But there's a special kind of helicopter. There's only one special kind of helicopter that can fly that high. So in some ways, the drones can go higher. Very cool. Well, we've got Juliet wondering what the coldest weather was while you were there. And we've got Cece who's wondering if anyone on the team got frostbite. Good question. So we were actually at Everest Base Camp in January on a reconnaissance trip before we took our spring trip in April and May to do the mapping. So it was much colder in January. And at Everest Base Camp, when we were there in January, it was about minus 25 Celsius. So about five or 10 below zero Fahrenheit. So that was cold. Um, but way high up on the mountain, it's more like minus 40, minus 35 or 40 uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius. They actually meet there at about minus 40. So in the winter, it's very cold. It actually warms up in the spring. Um, and so it was warmer in April and May, but that was the coldest. What was the other question, Celeste? Anybody get frostbite? So yes, one of our teammates who was way high up, the one of the uh, weather specialists who was putting in a weather station, he got frostbite on his ear. So fortunately it wasn't too bad. And once it warmed up, it just blistered and then healed. But you can actually lose a part of your ear if it gets really frozen. Ooh, uh, definitely wear your hats this winter, I guess. We can learn from that. We've got Jacob in the chat bar who's heard a lot about the work and a lot about the challenges. And he's wondering, did you have any fun while you were on Mount Everest? Oh yes, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a lot of hard work. And some days I would wake up and I'd be so tired. I just want to take a little bit of a break and I'd have to go out and haul my LIDAR camera on my, uh, on my shoulder up and down the, the very treacherous hills. But there was a lot of fun. We had a lot of camaraderie. So a lot of good friends that I made on the science team and we got to talk with lots of people, most of whom were there to climb the mountain or to help people climb the mountain. So I had a wonderful conversation. I was walking through somebody's camp, trying to be as polite as possible. And one of the older Sherpa guides, one of the Nepali guides came out and I was a little concerned that he was gonna tell me that he didn't want me walking through his camp, but no, he, he came up with a cup of tea and he and I sat down for a half hour conversation and he had been guiding on the mountain for 30 years. And so he was telling me stories about what it was like there 30 years ago when there were far fewer people and it was a lot more challenging to climb the mountain and to be there in the high mountains. Awesome. Well, we've got the Hefner family here with us. Do you guys wanna ask a question? <laughs> Hi, we were curious, who has access to the pictures that you took and how is it benefiting the map community? So there's a couple of different types of pictures that we took. Obviously we took photos of what we were doing and the people and National Geographic owns those and uses those to, to teach and to talk about the mountain and the trip. But all the uh, photographs that we took to make the maps those are already being used by scientists and we're releasing the mapping data and the photographs that we use to create the maps to the science community so that they can study the high mountain environment. And they are looking at things like the changes to the glaciers because the glaciers are retreating, they're getting smaller. Um, and that's a concern for the high mountain uh, communities that rely on the glaciers for water. And then the biologists are looking for plants in the photos. They wanna see where the plants are. So a lot of that is going freely to the science community. And then a lot of the photographs you're gonna see in National Geographic Resources on the Education Library and other places. 
Um, there's quite a few videos, I think. I bet there's links to them somewhere. There sure are. Check out the event guide for, for this very Explorer Classroom episode. Um, Shia in the chat bar has kind of the exact opposite question of Jacob. Shia is wondering, is there anything boring about Mount Everest? Wow. Well, mostly it wasn't boring, but I've got to say that there were some mornings, like I said, where I woke up and I sort of wanted to be able to take a shower and there's no shower at Everest Base Camp. So I was five weeks without a shower. So yeah, I got bored of not being able to take a shower. That's fair. Another fun question from the chat bar. Is there a bedtime and a wake up call on Mount Everest? <laughs> it's more like, can you make yourself stay awake? Cause you're so tired from all the work and any work you do at 18,000 feet makes you much more tired. So there was no strict bedtime, but there was breakfast time. And if you missed breakfast time, then you didn't get the good breakfast. You just had to eat cold leftovers. So that's what got you up in the morning was knowing that there was hot drinks and good food for breakfast. Awesome. We've got Kaya wondering what the most challenging map you've ever made is. So this was probably the most challenging work I've ever had to do to collect the data to make maps. So I'd say this was definitely the hardest work I've ever done for collecting the data. Um, everything from working with my teammates who did the helicopter work to working with my friend Chris. Uh, he and I were at base camp for six, uh, six weeks. So that's the hardest data collection I've done. Um, the most difficult map um, so I've done some maps, 3D mountain maps for National Geographic magazine. And there's one map that I made actually of a mountain in the United States called Mount Washington in New Hampshire. And in many ways, that map was very difficult to make because it was going in National Geographic magazine. And we had 12 different rounds of edits and changes to the maps. So I had to make that map 12 times. Oh, doing the same homework 12 times. Ooh. Good map at the end. I bet it was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I bet you're exactly right. Well, we've got Natalie wondering what's on your bucket list, Alex? What do you want to map next? Well, I have never, I love mapping mountains. So I got to go to the Himalaya, which is the highest mountain in the range in the world. But I would love to go to South America and do some, do some mapping in the Andes, especially way down at the tip of South America. There's a place called Patagonia, which has some beautiful mountains coming out of the glaciers. And I'd love to go down there and do some mapping. I've never been that far down in South America. So that's on my bucket list for sure. Love that. And Alex, as all of these young explorers head out and maybe start making their own maps, do you have any advice for that? Absolutely. So there's a couple ways you can do it. And I always think that starting with pencil and paper and mapping your neighborhood and things that you see, that's a great way to go. But also explore digital tools for mapping. You can record your locations on your phone as you walk around and put them on a map. So there's lots of different ways to do mapping, but the tools are really you know, one just different ways of doing the same thing, which is to record information that you see in the world and then try to understand it through a map, which is a picture of the world. That's awesome. And Alex, do you have any general advice from the National Geographic geographer to all of our students out there watching today? I always like to tell people to not just think like a geographer, which is to try and understand the world around you, but see the world as a geographer. When you see something and you're like, why is that there? Think about why is it there? Why are there trees of this kind? Why are there pine trees here and oak trees somewhere else? Or why did they build all the houses here and not somewhere else? So there's lots of questions you can ask. Look at the world and ask questions about it. I absolutely love that. What cool advice. Well, Thank you so much, of course, to Alex, but also to our friends at the Mott Foundation for their support on this awesome event series. Thank you to all of you for coming to today's event. I wanna wish everyone a happy Native American Heritage Month and a very happy Geography Awareness Week. 
And I, of course, want to remind you all to check out Explore Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. Thank you again to Alex for this amazing lesson. Thank you to all of you for your incredible, thoughtful questions. Keep that energy, keep that conversation going. You can send your grownups on Twitter to at natgeoeducation using hashtag Explorer Classroom. We'd love to keep talking, keep answering those questions and keep the geography excitement in motion. But for now, uh, everybody has been so patient, so quiet, so absolutely wonderful. I think it's time for us to maybe like get kind of loud maybe um how about if all of our participants were to unmute themselves and on the count of three we'll scream goodbye and thank you to alex ready one two three goodbye. Goodbye.